Hi everybody. Welcome back to the technical stage of API Days Live Singapore 2021. This is the day one, day one programs in the technical track. In continuation with the sessions in the connecting the stack, we have next set of four sessions lined up. Joining us first will be Mark Tihan, Principal Solution Engineer at Confluent APAC. He'll be talking to us about REST, the events, REST APIs for event-driven architecture. Thank you very much, Prasad. Yeah, uh, hello. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Hello, everyone. Uh, hope you all had a nice lunch, and it's a, a pleasure to be here to speak with you today. Uh, I'm Mark Tihan. I work for Confluent here in Singapore. I'm a principal engineer. Uh, and today's talk is entitled REST, the events, REST APIs for event-driven architecture. Um, I guess... Uh, unsurprisingly, for an API day's talk, there's lots of Kafka today, um, and that's really what I do. I, I, I sort of work with uh, organizations across the region, really, on anything to do with Apache Kafka. Uh, lots of banks and digital natives and insurance companies and lots of other industries that are really using Apache Kafka. So um, today's talk is really having a look at uh, the different REST API options that are available for Apache Kafka and my recommendations on when to use them and when not to use them. Um, there is, uh, if, if you saw the earlier talk from Ido from Rapid API, I highly recommend it. Uh, he really went quite deep on synchronous versus asynchronous. Um, so I'm going to be getting uh, get a, a little more into the sort of implementation details of where the various APIs that you can call um, if you are going to do REST-based calls to a Kafka system. Um, before we get into things, I guess a quick recap on what is Kafka. Um, for uh, you know, uh, not not you know, not everybody uses Kafka every day. Uh, it's a very popular open source project, and uh, uh, just a quick recap. You know, a Kafka system consists of brokers, and they are clustered together. So a minimum system is generally three brokers, uh, but you know there are systems in Southeast Asia of thirty plus brokers, and uh, uh, if we look at some of the systems uh, a bit further afield, eighty to one hundred brokers is uh, is not unheard of. Um, writers send data to a Kafka cluster. Readers read data from a Kafka cluster. Writers are often called producers. Readers are often called consumers. And it's a modern distributed platform for data streams. And I think the, the part that makes it complicated is really the, the distributed part. Um, you know, it's a cluster of brokers. And, and obviously, the, the writers and readers are generally um, small footprint services, generally some form of microservices is pretty common. Um, if you want a bit more information about Kafka and kind of its origins and where it fits into the whole data landscape, uh, how, it, how it compares you know, to database-based systems and big data-based systems, have a look at uh, Tim Berglund, my colleague, uh, his video on this on YouTube. So I, I have various QR codes scattered throughout this talk, so have your kind of camera ready if you want to. Um, use those. So as I said, I work with a lot of companies that are using Apache Kafka across the region. I mostly work in Singapore and Thailand these days. Um, and you know, we as a company, Confluent is a company behind Apache Kafka. So the, the creators of Apache Kafka are the founders of Confluent. Uh, we're based here at SunTech in Singapore. Come see us if you're Singapore based. Um, so the, the type of apps that I generally work on are often event driven applications, uh, you know, which is a, a major subject in API days. Uh, looking at various data in motion, so real-time streaming of data around the organization. A lot, I do a lot of mainframe offload, uh, mostly from core banking systems, um, and also shipping logs and metrics and traces, which is quite a traditional Kafka pattern. Um, so let's let's take a quick look at the different ways that you can sort of build uh, an application that's going to talk to Apache Kafka. So most uh, most client applications are written in Java. So Kafka is a Java-based application. It has clients for various uh, frameworks, including Java, which is the most popular one. And though you, you write an application, include the Kafka client library, that then enables you to talk to a Kafka cluster, and you can start producing uh, or writing data into a topic. And a topic is something like a database table. Um, similarly, on the, on the data reader side, the application will include the Kafka library in order to consume messages. What if you don't want to use the Java framework? Um, so it's, it is, of course, possible to communicate via HTTP. One of the ways of doing this is using the REST proxy. 
Um, so setting up request response calls that will produce and consume to the Kafka brokers in the same way that you would produce and consume using the Kafka client if you wrote a .NET application. The other, sorry, a Java application. The other client frameworks that are available and supported are .NET and Python. And there's a whole bunch of sort of unsupported and uh, clients of various degrees of completeness available on GitHub. So that's two ways of talking to Kafka. A third way, very common, is to do change data capture using the Kafka Connect API. Kafka con consists of three APIs, so the core brokers that most are familiar with. Uh, Kafka Connect came next, which is a framework for doing data in motion and really streaming in and out of data stores. Um, and the third is Kafka Streams, which we're not really talking about today. And of course, it's possible to, 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 sh to send data from a Kafka topic through Kafka Connect and let it do inserts back out to a database again. And then the third major category of systems and, and the way you want to interact with a system are you know, for uh, large applications that don't either have an accessible database layer and you know, are not easily uh, interacted with via one of the popular frameworks such as Java or .NET. Sometimes these are called legacy applications, slightly offensive term, I guess. But these are generally sort of large vendor applications such as SAP or Oracle NetSuite and all of these sorts of apps. It is possible to use Kafka Connect with a HTTP sync in order to send data to these systems if they run their own REST endpoints, like, like SAP PI or PO. Um, and those systems are also able to interact using the REST proxy. So for today's talk, um, we're going to be looking at a few different areas here. We're going to focus, first of all, on kind of request response as a, as a, a communication paradigm for Kafka and how this compares with event streaming, um, which is uh, point two here. Uh, number three, we'll, let's take a look at the REST proxy and see what's the difference in using a REST proxy and HTTP calls in order to interact with the Kafka system versus doing event streaming. And the fourth will be the actual uh, REST endpoints that are built into the Kafka brokers themselves. So let's get started uh, with request response. And a little bit like Ido's uh, sync versus async talk earlier this morning, you know, request response is a HTTP call. And your client sends a request and waits for a response. And you're really notifying something that should happen on the system. These are generally fairly low latency. They're typically point to point. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's usually a presumption of a response. Um, and, uh, and it uses a predefined API. You need to know what it is you're going to do in advance and have that API available. This compares with event streaming. Um, and event streaming is really uh, more a case of continuous processing. Um, so messages are received into a queue, or as we call it in Kafka, a topic. And basically, the data writer or the producer drops the message, and it doesn't care when that's going to be processed. It, it may or may not be consumed later, and it might be consumed by one or many consumers. The producer doesn't care. Um, and, you're, and the producer is really notifying something that has already happened, um, and that's generally the contents of the, of the message. This is continuous processing. It's often referred to as event-driven. Um, there's no presumption of a response. Uh, you know, so it drops the message into the topic and moves on and drops the next message into a topic. It doesn't care uh, who consumes that. And these are often used for sort of general purposes purpose events. So um, how do you weigh up which, which of these two schemes to use? Um, and perhaps looking at the challenges is a good way of sort of evaluating these. Um, with request response, it's difficult to enforce standards across services. I know that you know, I work at a bank that have built their entire mobile banking application using request response. And it's relatively easy to get started. But as the system matures and complexity grows, it you know, some real challenges emerge. Um, with keeping the uh, point three here, the inter-service dependencies um, across all of the services. Scaling can be challenging. You know, if you're deploying in Dockerized containers or on Kubernetes, you have an easy way of scaling up more and more client services. And it's important that, that you're also able to scale the calls back to your uh, Kafka system uh, in a similar manner. Um, the services themselves are required to maintain state. So as, as values are returned from Kafka and that require, need to be stored in various variables, the, uh, you know, it's the, the client application is responsible for doing this. Um, and if it's a multi-threaded application, this, this gets more complex. Um, and also just the, the general complexity of, of deploying these types of applications um, and uh, you know, requires some form of load balancing. Uh, you know, as, as, Idi, as Ido said earlier in his talk, you know, sometimes this is seen as a sort of a, a, a 
you know, um, not considered a modern way of building applications. It's not entirely fair. There are cases where it really makes more sense to use uh, a request response type scheme. So the challenges of doing things uh, with Kafka are sometimes the infrastructure on the client side can get more complex as, as you think about things like your service goals, your delivery guarantees, fault tolerance, retries, things like that. Um, event thinking in general is hard. So adopting the Kafka way to do this, uh, you can you can sort of you know design this yourself, or you can look for thought leaders on how this uh, how this can be done. Th uh, th um, I was going uh, the uh, ThoughtWorks are a great consultancy company uh, that lead sort of lead the way on uh, on event streaming, and you'll find a lot of material in our blog as well on the different ways of doing this. So which scheme to use? Um, and, and when is it a better choice to use HTTP uh, to interact with Kafka? Let's take a look at three categories of uh, three categories of reasons for doing this. The first is on the management plane. Um, it makes sense to use HTTP calls in order to interact with your cluster on the management plane. So management of your Kafka topics and consumer groups and access control lists and things like that, because these are generally fairly low volume and low intensity calls. Um, and if you're doing CICD and DevOps integration, if you're using GitHub or ServiceNow or any of these sorts of services and you want to be able to automate creation of topics and schemas and ACLs and all that sort of stuff, makes a lot of sense to use the HTTP APIs for this. The second, on the data plane, if you're dealing with a mobile application, this is actually quite a natural fit for request response as well. Um, so, and often, uh, often mobile applications will use web sockets and sort of server send events. It's somewhat unusual for a mobile application to connect directly to a Kafka server, but there are instances. Um, and often, you know, you could swap out mobile applications for sort of devices if that's if that's your current architecture. So legacy applications, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes uh, you know offbeat middleware. If you're trying to sort of code something in a client that does not have an approved Kafka client or any Kafka client or something that you don't trust, then it, then it can make more sense to use this. Uh, you know, we have uh, we we work with various companies across the region that, particularly with SAP systems, PI and PO, uh, it makes a lot of sense to to call these services. Um, uh, using the REST proxy and then pass payloads from Kafka topics in and out of the REST interfaces for these services. If you use an API gateway, so MuleSoft or Kong or uh, Apigee, these types of systems, um, and, and the, the, the development preference in your organization is to do as much as possible via the API gateway, then it obviously makes sense to do things using HTTP. Um, and finally, what if you're just using other languages where you have minimal support for Kafka client? So COBOL or ABAP or Erlang, Kotlin, th there's various levels of uh, Kafka client support for these. Um, so uh, you, you may prefer to use HTTP. And then the other reasons for opting for HTTP could be technology lock-in. Um, there are companies that, that don't want to be tied to Java or .NET or Python uh, or Go and they want to um, keep everything as HTTP. Um, and generally familiarity, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an easier leap to request response than it is to event streaming, particularly if you're coming from a database development background. So it seems more familiar to simply adopt request response than to go with event streaming. Uh, securing HTTP ports is just easier. Um, you know, it's more challenging to set up uh, uh, authentication and encryption when you're communicating uh, sort of event streaming communication via uh, TCP. Um, and finally, if, you're, if you have adopted a uh, particular domain-driven design paradigm, then you may well use both. Okay, So you might be using HTTP for some synchronous stuff, um, and then sort of use a Kafka pro protocol and a framework wherever possible for decoupling. Uh, and often these are combined with a service mesh. So you could be using something like Istio um, in order to combine both paradigms into a single uh, mesh. So that really were, were the um, sort of decision points about which, uh, which to use, uh, HTTP or sort of the Kafka native client. So let's talk about some of the actual REST APIs that are available for Kafka. Now, some of these are on Kafka. Some are on uh, Confluent Community, which you can download. And it's a, it's a community uh, platform that includes the, the current release of Apache Kafka, along with a whole bunch of other uh, community licensed services. There's no license obligations. Or, well, there's a license obligation, but there's no, there's no charges or anything to use this. And the Confluent Community Edition is very widely used. And then there's, of course, the Confluent Enterprise Edition. So we're going to be looking at three of these. The REST Proxy, uh, which comes under the community license, the Confluent Broker REST, 
which comes under the enterprise and Confluent Cloud REST API. We look at that one very briefly as well. So first, a REST proxy. Um, so it's a RESTful interface uh, for an Apache Kafka cluster. It runs on its own, generally a pair of VMs. Uh, so uh, both services will start up, they will cluster, connect to the brokers, and then they will wait for REST calls from your application. So uh, the example I gave earlier is a, is a company that uses a lot of SAP, PI, and PO. And from their ABAP program, they make calls to the REST endpoint in order to produce and consume back to Kafka topics. Um, so you can produce and consume messages, you know, which is the main thing that you want the Kafka cluster to do. Um, you can view the metadata of the cluster, and you can perform various administrative actions. Uh, the metadata plane are managing and viewing status on your brokers, topics, consumer groups, and ACLs. This is generally used if you're building some sort of an internal uh, portal for for event streaming in your company, right? If you want to be able to uh, for a, a place where you can go to create, where users can create topics, define their schema, set up their ACLs, and all that, then it would make sense to do all of this via the REST proxy. And on the data plane, uh, so being able to produce and consume. Uh, at scale for for your various topics, including quite complex produce and consume patterns using consumer groups, uh, using multiple topics, and and all of these sorts of patterns. Um, so uh, generally, uh, I recommend that start with two VMs or Docker containers in your REST proxy, um, and then consider and just scale that out uh, as you need to. When you add the third, you get 33% more capacity. Add a fourth, you get 25% more capacity, and so on. Um, so that's, that was the first uh, option to interact uh, via REST with your system. The second is a Confluent Broker REST. So um, these are this is a REST port that runs on the broker. So if you're already a Kafka user, you're probably familiar with port 9092, which is the uh, traditional, uh, sorry, the default port for producing and consuming to the broker. There are other ports that you can enable and open on your brokers. And one of those is the broker REST port. Um, and something like the REST proxy, uh, it, it allows you to do quite a lot of metadata uh, interaction with your Kafka cluster. So uh, bro uh, broadly across these categories, you can describe, list, and configure your brokers, and so on. Uh, you will notice that these are all uh, metadata-related categories. There's no data produce and consume here. That's coming soon. Um, so then it will be possible uh, for, for those of you that run the Confluence system, um, it will be possible to um, to produce and consume over REST to the brokers without having any additional VMs or Docker services running. And uh, just very briefly on the Confluent Cloud REST API. So Confluent Cloud is our serverless uh, offering uh, that lets you run Apache Kafka on your cloud provider of choice in your region of choice, where you don't have to manage brokers or zookeepers or anything like that. So this was launched. the, the, the uh, Confluent Cloud has been around for quite some time. Uh, so we launched REST APIs for cloud um, in February. Uh, metadata still, so connectors, users, and service accounts and environments, like prod test dev, that sort of thing. Um, and we will soon be adding metadata management for topics and ACLs and consumer lag. So if you have uh, GitHub workflows that you have built for Apache Kafka, it's relatively easy to switch these over to uh, Confluent Cloud if you ever wanted to use a serverless version um, and just swap those calls out for the REST API calls on Confluent Cloud. And we have published the API for the Confluent Cloud uh, REST APIs. Um, so you can just sort of Google that and take a look and see, uh, drill down a bit and see what are the um, the various calls that you can make. Um, I never really got into the REST gateways today. So things like MuleSoft and Apigee and Kong and all that, because that is really a whole other way of interacting with your Kafka system over REST. It's a, it's a, it would it's, it would take more than 20 minutes. My colleague Kai has uh, blogged on this uh, on a, a few different times. So I do recommend taking a look at this particular blog post. Uh, and if this is an area of interest for you, please get in touch with me. Um, and just as I finish, you know, there's exciting news last night for the people in the Apache Kafka world. So Kafka AK 2.8 was released. Um, and this has been long awaited because it's the version with no, it's the preview version with no zookeeper. So the, the the consensus is built into the Kafka brokers, and you no longer have a dependence on a second uh, second uh, cluster bunch of cluster nodes uh, for Zookeeper. Um, so you can take a look at the YouTube video that Tim released overnight, uh, just announcing uh, Kip 500 with the uh, with the Zookeeper removal and a bunch of other features that are available with uh, Apache Kafka 
2.8. And that concludes my talk. Uh, I'm just on time. Uh, as I say, there's my contact details. Uh, you can read tn at confluent.io is probably the easiest way to reach me uh, or ping me on LinkedIn uh, if that's what you want to do. And we have time for questions. Prasant. Uh, yeah. Hey, thanks, Mark, for this uh, wonderful session. Uh, just uh, uh, one question. Um, so which are the industries um, that are adopting an event-driven architecture uh, more when compared to others? Who are the leaders and the, who are the laggards there, actually? Right? Um, I think the, the two categories that really stand out uh, are financial services, in particular retail banking, because okay. event streaming really fits into uh, the, the architecture for mobile banking and just being able to ship a very rich data set to, to, uh, to phones and mobile banking applications. Ka uh, event streaming in Kafka is a very natural fit for this world. And increasingly, we're doing a lot of um, sort of integration with mainframe core banking systems. So the big old IBM systems and trying to uh, stream data from these systems out to digital banking applications. So that's one. The second category is no big surprise, digital native companies. So the ride sharing companies, food delivery, because um, these companies uh, ship tremendous amounts of data around and, and really data in motion is, is really what it's all about uh, for, for quality of user experience. These are the big categories. We're starting to see more emerge in manufacturing and insurance and utilities. I think these are the areas that uh, you'll see much more in event streaming over the next year or two. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, and or of, about the new organizations or from the traditional industries, the organizations who are moving into the event-driven architecture currently. So uh, where do you see the push coming from? Is it again, like many in many organizations, the APIs are predominantly driven from the business side than from the technical side. So is it a similar thing in the, for the event-driven architecture also, or is it more driven by the technical team? No, I, I think it's large. I think it's a desire to modernize platforms. Um, th many of these are industries that are running on legacy systems. Legacy systems are still going to be around for years, if not decades. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, and, and APIs offer uh, offer an interface to to sort of link the the legacy world with the uh, much more um, agile microservice world. Um, so yeah, I think uh, APIs are really the glue between these two types of platforms. Um, and, and Kafka has become sort of a de facto platform for sharing data between uh, uh, sort of legacy and, and microservice-based platforms. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thank uh, you very much. That's fine. Yeah, thank you.